Hey, Tim, it's Brian Smith with uh, Risk Reconnaissance and part of the Insurance Office of America. You and I have had a, uh, an opportunity to meet via LinkedIn and thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about a topic that is near and dear to a lot of companies on the government contracting side. Equally important for those that are used to the commercial side and they're looking at government contracting and that's called indirect rates. And when we talked originally, you had indicated that it wouldn't be a bad idea to have about have a discussion about this and for you to cover, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes worth of information to help someone that's interested in government contracting understand this very important aspect that's related to their work. But before we get started, I'm Brian Smith, and I have created the Risk Reconnaissance, which is dedicated to government contracting, risk management, and insurance solutions. And as you may already know, I'm an insurance broker with the Insurance Office of America located in Atlanta. And today I have Tim DiGiuseppe. Uh, and Tim, I, I asked him before we even got started, I, sorry about this, I, I already fumbled the, the name, DiGiuseppe. Uh, and Tim joins us as a professional that works routinely with government contractors across the country. So, uh, Tim, I'm, I'm really glad we have a chance to talk today. Why don't you tell a little bit more about what you do and who you are? Okay, um, I'm basically a CPA. I have been in the consulting business for well over 20 years, working with companies of all different sizes, small to large, large defense contractors. Um, I bring the knowledge of how the, the government likes to see the cost that they're paying for, the level of detail they want. And for companies that are thinking about getting into it or have gotten into it, it's a different world than you do with any of your commercial customers. Tim, with all the things that we could have discussed today, we uh, you had specifically brought up indirect rates. Tell me why you think that's important for this, for this topic and for our audience today, which is predominantly government contractors. Indirect rates for an area that could cause trouble for companies, that seems to be the most. And the reason being is a lot of companies, especially starting out companies, don't take the time to understand either themselves or bringing somebody in to help them understand why does the government want to see things the way they want to see things. And, and you know, when they don't, they end up charging stuff through through the government that they shouldn't. The government doesn't like that. And remember, the government does not have a bottom line to worry about, so they have a lot of resources to go after you. Um, and companies have gone out of business, companies have lost patent rights, com people and companies have gone to jail because they haven't spent time to understand what's going on and just went into it blindly. That's what I try to help companies do, avoid those risks and teach them this is what you need to do, this is why you need to do it, and this is a way to mitigate risk. Working with the government, there's no such thing as 100% compliant. So the best you can do is educate yourself, get the right people in place, mitigate those risks. One of the things that we talked about before was that it's not complicated. It, when you're looking at it from your perspective in your role, but if it's not a complicated issue, why is it commonplace for, for companies to get in trouble with this? Well, when I say it's not complicated, I'm talking about the actual calculation of a rate, which is a division, a, a denominator into a numerator. Where the complication comes in is what goes into that numerator. What type of cost structures do you have? And, and when you look at what are the appropriate cost pools, indirect cost pools, you have to look at what am I doing for the government? What type of product am I selling? What type of service am I selling? What are the indirect cost pools that I should have? For most small companies, mid-sized companies, they can get away with the basic three. You get a French benefit pool, you have an overhead pool, and you have what's called a general and administrative pool which is they referred to as GNA. Mm -hmm. A lot of commercial companies refer to that GNA as SGNA, sales, general, and administrative. Well, when you're a commercial business, you have commercial customers, your accounting basically says, this is what I'm booking in sales revenue. These are my direct costs on that contract. 
my profit margin is 40, 50%. That's gonna cover everything else and help me make money. And that's fine commercially. The government says, I don't like to see it that way. Everything below that gross margin line, I want broken out into details. I wanna know what costs I'm paying for because I wanna make sure I'm paying for stuff that I should be paying for and not paying for stuff that I shouldn't be paying for. And that's where the complexity comes in. Um, identifying what indirect cost pools are appropriate for your business, identifying what cost goes into those pools. And one of the things the government has a real heartburn over is what they refer to costs that are unallowable. Costs that are unallowable are costs the government says they will definitely not pay for. And there's three groupings of costs in the government. Those are the costs that are expressly allowable, which means the government will pay for your direct cost, uh, a lot of your business costs and stuff that they will pay for. There is what's called expressly unallowable. Those are costs that the government says, absolutely no way I'm gonna pay for, such as alcohol, first class uh, airfares. Um, you're a manufacturer, you have uh, trucks to move things around. The government will pay for an S10 pickup truck to do that. They will not pay for a Cadillac Escalade to do that because it's you know not a reasonable thing to do. Companies get themselves in a lot of trouble, especially private-owned companies, because they like to run a lot of personal stuff through, which the government will not pay for also. And you know, so it's understanding what cost categories are for your company and appropriate for your company, understanding what cost goes into those categories, understanding what the government will not pay for. That's the complexity. That's where it gets complex. And it gets more complex as the company grows because as a company grows, more rules come down on the company as to what the government says you have to, you do not have to do. A good example of that is the Truth and Negotiations Act. Up until 2018, any contract over $750,000, you had to do what was called certified cost pricing data. Basically what that means is when the contract is signed, you're certifying that everything that's in your cost proposal is current, accurate, and complete. The person who signs that is the person that can be held civilly and criminally liable if that's wrong. That's the person that needs to have in their closet a custom-made orange jumpsuit, just in case they're not doing things right. Um, now that number is $2 million. So anything $2 million and below you should not be required, you're, if you're a sub and you're working for Prime, the Prime should not be making you certify because it's below that threshold. A lot of companies, they'll get a proposal through from Prime and those proposals have a lot of clauses and they don't take the time to say what really should apply to me and what shouldn't. So they get a contract that's under $2 million, but the, the Prime sets down this TINA rule that shouldn't apply to them, is asking them to certify and they go ahead and do it, well, guess what? You signed up for it. Instead of taking an exception and going back and saying, no, that doesn't apply to me. Anyway, I've gotten a little off track here. From what you've said is being familiar with what the rules are, obviously, and knowing um, what you can and, and can't have as, an, as a, what is considered a reasonable cost, what is an allowable cost. But how does that, how is that determined or what, how do indirect rates affect, how, how does that tie in? Okay, when you are proposing on a government contract, you have, you're building, you're doing what's called a cost buildup. Right. All right. Now, the, the exception to this is if you're in a competitive environment. In other words, the government says, I know what I want and I know what it should cost. So I'm just going to go out to a bunch of contractors and have them give me a price. Okay. There's no negotiation. They don't ask for any cost buildup or anything like that. That's a competitively awarded contract. The government has no right to come in and audit you. They're always fixed price contracts. You have no right to come in and adjust your price or anything. You gave them a price and they accepted it. It's like you walk, it's like the government walking into Home Depot and telling Home Depot, I want that hammer, but you could have proved to me why I have to pay $10 for it. The government can't do it on that type of contract. Mm -hmm. But on a negotiated contract where they say, Give me your cost buildup in detail. Well, part of that is your direct cost. 
your labor, your materials, your subcontractors, stuff like that. You know, those are your direct costs on the contract. Your indirect costs are a percentage that's applied to those numbers that allows you to cover your overhead and your GNA costs. Now, the difference between overhead and GNA is, for the most part, if you don't have any contracts, you really don't have an overhead, overhead cost. Overhead is a cost you incur to support the contract. If you're a manufacturer, it would be your factory floor, your machines, your, your indirect labor, your stuff like that would go into that cost pool. Um, so if you're just starting out, you know, you're, you have some fixed overhead costs, so there'll always be something there. But the driving numbers are, are going to be driven by the contracts, okay? And the support that those contracts require, supervisors, foremans, different people like that. Your GNA costs, your general administrative costs, is a cost you incur for just being in business. Mm -hmm. Your executives, your accounting shop, your IT group. Those are costs that you're going to have whether you've got a contract or not. Okay, so those are your two basic um, primary uh, indirect cost pools. The third one is your French benefit cost pools. And that's where all the benefits of company, and this is only the company's cost of French benefits for holidays, sick pay, workman's comp, the employer's uh, share of Social Security and Medicare. That goes into the French pool. And so those you for most small companies, those are really the only three indirect cost pools they're going to need to have. So when you look at that, you say, okay, now how do I calculate the rates? What are the rates for these three primary ones? And I'll get into a little more detail when we're getting more complicated. When you're doing your French pool, it's all your French benefits that go to your employees. Guaranteed cost, okay? And the reason why I say guarantee is because a lot of companies make the mistake of putting in the French pool bonuses. Okay. Well, bonuses aren't guaranteed. <clears throat> I mean, you don't have an employment contract that says, I'll get a 10% bonus regardless of what I do all year. Never works that way. The bonuses don't belong in the French pool. But holiday pay, sick pay, workman's comp, the taxes that the employer pays, those are all guaranteed French benefits. So that goes into the pool. The base for your French pool is going to be your total labor cost, both direct and indirect. The calculation itself is simple. You've got, say, $3 million in French benefits. You have a million dollars in total labor. Your percentage is 30%. So, you know, that's your French rate. We can get into a little bit later, what do we do with that? There's a couple different ways. Some companies, they can track their employees. They have such a sophisticated system. They can track the employees and they can assign the French benefit to wherever the labor goes. Some companies take the simple approach and they just automatically take that percentage and allocate it to overhead GNA and just, you know, make it a, a sub pool to overhead and GNA. Now, your overhead pool, again, as I said, that's your cost to support what you're doing. So if you're a manufacturer, your overhead is going to include everything related to that process to support producing that product that the government's buying from you. Okay. For most companies, the base is going to be direct labor. I would say probably 90% of the companies is going to be direct labor. That is starting to change because of automation. So you're going to look at, okay, I have an overhead pool of X dollars and I have direct labor of X dollars. That direct labor is then divided into the pool and you come up with your overhead rate. With automation, a lot of companies are being coming, becoming very automated. And, and when you're looking at what base should I be using for my overhead, what is the driving cost? Like I said, a lot of company, it's labor because they're labor intensive. Companies that have automated, they're not labor intensive. They're machine intensive. It's the machines that drive most of that support cost because there's very few people because they've automated. So you're looking at a base then that probably is going to be machine hour cost instead of labor hour cost. 
So those that's where some that's where things get complicated. Okay, you've identified these are my support costs, but what is the appropriate base? Well, what's driving those costs in the pool? It's it's a cause and relationship benefit. So if if I've got a cost pool, an overhead cost pool, it's being driven by what? Is it labor? Is it machine hours? Is it whatever it is? So you have to take time to say, what are my driving, my cost drivers? What should that base be? And overhead is where that gets complicated, depending on how automated you are, how automated you aren't. Um, now your GNA pool, what goes into your GNA pool is all your business cost, just to be in business. Everything that is not in the overhead pool, or the, you know, well, you'll have your fringe, depending how you're doing your fringe, uh, it could be included in it. The government gives you three different types of pool bases to calculate your GNA rate. One is, and, and this first one is probably by 95% of the companies, this is what they do. It's called total cost input. And what total cost input means is everything, all your costs, direct, overhead, everything that's not in the GNA pool okay. goes into the base. And that's what you use to calculate your GNA rate. That can get complicated depending on how many pools you got. Um, what a lot of people don't understand is this is where some companies get in trouble. When we talked about unallowable cost, you can have unallowable costs that are in your overhead pool and you have unallowable costs that are in your GNA pool. Costs the government says they will not pay for. The total cost input approach says everything that's not in the GNA pool. So when you're calculating your overhead rate, you're calculating it net of any unallowable costs that were identified for that pool because the government will pay for that. Okay. When you're doing total cost input for your GNA, those unallowable costs that you did not use to calculate over it must be in the base to calculate the GNA pool because the government's position is, is even though we're not paying for it, there's certain general administrative costs that are in, sort, in support of those overhead costs that we're not going to pay for. Mm -hmm. This is what confuses company. They go, well, wait a minute, you know, I can't have it here, but I have to have it here. Why? Well, it's just the way the government wants. Doesn't mean it's logical. It's just the way the government wants it. Your GNA pool will have certain unallowable costs. Uh, your executive salaries may exceed what the government says they're willing to pay for. Um, you are allowing your executives to ride first class. So the difference between first class and what's in the GSA travel regs for that area, that's unallowable. So you have to take that out of the pool. Now, what happens to the GNA unallowable cost? Well, it doesn't get in any calculations anywhere. It actually comes off your bottom line. I have gone into companies and we've done an evaluation of their cost structures and we've taken significant dollars out of the GNA because the companies were privately held and they were running a lot of personal stuff through that the government won't pay for. And it goes directly to the bottom line. Well, if it goes to the bottom line, you're reducing your profit rates. The one advantage, I try to tell people the way the government wants, well, it's a real, can be a real pain the way the government wants things, requires a lot of work. Once you set it up, it's usually fairly straightforward. But it gives you a picture into your cost drivers that you don't get on your commercial side when everything is buried under the profit margin. So you can see, well, why am I incurring this level of cost that the government won't pay for? Am I really getting any benefit out of it other than personal benefit? So, and it also helps you look at, you know, okay, this is making me non-competitive. I've got all these costs I can't do anything with. And so it, it, I try to encourage the, the company, my clients that have both commercial and government, they actually do what they're going on the government side cost-wise to do it on the commercial side. Because it gives them a visibility level of their cost drivers and can help make them more competitive even on the commercial side of the house. So, so the complexity is not the actual calculation. The complexity is identifying the cost. Where do those costs belong? Because sometimes you'll have costs that go between multiple pools. Uh, you have a manufacturer facility that also has offices in it. Well, you're going to divide 
the square footage cost of the area, the manufacturing goes in overhead, the offices go into GNA. So you've got to spend a little time figuring out where. Uh, IT, you've got computers on the manufacturing floor, you've got computers in the offices. How are you going to divide this? Based on number of computers, whatever. You've got to figure out how to divide those things. The government starts targeting companies for reviews when they start hitting the 25 plus million dollars in contracts. You kind of get on the government's radar screen. Um, this has changed to some degree because of the government's inability to keep up on all the audits because of all the companies. So they're making the primes audit themselves. So you get on the primes audit, audit screens. And this is where they'll come in and they'll review how you're doing your accounting to determine whether they can rely on the way you do things. A good example, I had a client, I've been working with them now for about four years. They went from being a supplier to a subcontractor. Completely different rules set for them. Didn't take the time to understand what that meant. They worked for one of the, the major defense contractors. They had a large contract with them. That contractor came in and did a, when they gave them the contract, did a quick and easy and realized their accounting system really wasn't what it be, but they needed what my client was doing. So they put a, a memo in saying, well, we're going to come back later and audit you. And if we don't agree with your numbers, we're going to reduce your price. And you're going to owe us for any difference that you build in the intro. Well, they came back. They audited them. They found out that their cost structure and their proposal really didn't represent what their costs should be. And that client had a, what was it? It was a 1.5 plus million dollar claim against them from the prime on that contract. They brought us in. We went through their accounting system. We dug through their trial balances. We figured out what their true cost should be, what their true cost buildup should have been. Dealing with the prime who wasn't in a hurry to do anything, it took about two and a half, almost three years to get to a settlement. We got it down to a settlement of just a little over $200,000 because we dug into the numbers to determine what really those numbers should be. And the drivers were not so much the direct costs, the, in fact, the direct costs weren't really the driver. It was their indirect structure. They, it was just done completely wrong. So with that, that really had to have a negative impact on that subs pro, on that subs cash flow too. If they were expecting monies to be paid, did the prime hold up the payment until the audit yeah. was resolved? The internal audit was resolved. For a while, they did. We got them to back off once we showed them that we had come in and redone their rate structures to where they said, okay, I feel confident these numbers are true. Right. But there was a period of six or eight months, if I remember correctly, where they weren't getting paid, but they had to continue to perform because it was a fixed price contract. And, and, and that's where a lot of companies sometimes get in trouble. They don't understand the difference between a fixed price and a cost reimbursement contract. Well, just a little side note, when you do a fixed price contract, you're telling the government or your prime, I can do this job for this price. That's it. Boom. And they say, okay, fine. You get into the job and you find out your people didn't do a good job determining what the cost was. Right. All of a sudden it's costing you more. Prime or the government doesn't care. You agreed to do it at that price. You will have to perform at that price regardless of what it costs you. And it could be the opposite. If you overestimate, you can end up making more money. Under a cost reimbursement contract, which the government doesn't like because they feel like they get ripped off all the time for those, you're getting reimbursed for what your costs are as you incur those costs. So there is the government takes the risk on a cost reimbursement, you take the risk on a fixed price contract. Okay. So having your accounting system strong so you know what your true costs are because majority contracts now are fixed price, protects you from being at the other end where you didn't estimate it right, and all of a sudden you're losing money on this contract. Because it doesn't do any good to have a government contract if you're gonna lose money. Right. One of the things that I wanted to ask you is when you get the call or someone engages your company to come in and help them, because there's obviously been a, there was a, a situation that warranted expertise that was outside. 
What are some of the first things you do when you engage a new client and you're looking to see what is included or what has not been properly, actually what's probably been included in the indirect rates that shouldn't have been? What process do you go through to sort through that? What are the first things you look for? What is the first thing as part of your engagement? Well, we have a, a template that we use um, that we've been using for years and it is past audits every time. Our first step is one, we sit down with the company to understand what their business is. Okay, because we have to understand what they're doing and what are the potential cost drivers for what they're doing. Then we'll get a copy of their trial balance and their general ledger. The trial balance will be filtered into our template We'll look at the various accounts. We'll look at the cost numbers that are in those various accounts. Then we go back to the client and saying, okay, what is this? Because a lot of times they'll have an account, but they don't really have a good description of what that account is and what's going into it. That's one of the other things. If the government or crime comes in to audit you, they don't want just a chart of account accounts. They want a description for each account in that chart of accounts so they can understand what type of cost you're putting into those accounts. Uh, we had a client years ago that they owned all their manufacturing buildings. Mm -hmm. And when we got their trial balance, we started going through and we see a, a account line item, very large, called lease cost that they were charging the government for lease. They were charging the government market rate lease for buildings that they owned. Okay, government doesn't like that. They say you own it. You're not leasing. It's cost you're not incurring. You can only charge us for your cost of ownership, which is depreciation, maintenance, utilities, stuff like that. We took out probably in that first year almost $4 million out of their costs that they were charging through the government as unallowable lease costs that exceeded their cost of ownership because they had all their buildings they owned were fully depreciated. So the only thing they had was maintenance, utilities, basic upkeep, no depreciation. And they built in that amount of money when they were looking to when see they were, what they were gonna make each year. So they, they were looking at an additional $4 million of charge. Per year, charge to the government, yes. And, and, you know, so that just blew their numbers out, out of the, out the, out the door. Plus it was a privately owned company. So there was a lot of family stuff that was running through also because the prime was coming in to do an audit and they wanted us to come in and look at things before the prime got there. And, and so, you know, we addressed a lot of these issues. We changed because what they were doing what we found out what they were doing is this was on a proposal for a contract with a prime. So they haven't gotten a contract yet, but they were doing their cost buildups and the prime wanted to come in and do what's called a pre-award audit, mm -hmm. which for most cases is pretty much just a scratch and sniff where they would look at, can we rely on your accounting system? Do you have enough written policies and procedures or controls in place and stuff? And, and just for them to walk away and feel you know, warm and fuzzy that they can rely on your accounting system. We came in to basically do a pre-audit of that audit, but a lot more detail and, and dug in. So we were able to clean a lot of things up because this, this contract would have been under the TINA rules. And if they had billed the way it was, and then, then the contractor came in and audited them, that's called defective pricing. Okay, that's basically where you're certifying everything's correct, accurate and complete, when in reality, it's not. The government refers to that as defective pricing. Where it gets, you know, that's bad enough because you end up having to pay everything back plus interest. In, 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 in staying with that particular example where you engage them, the $4 million, finding that before the prime came in, first of all were they awarded the contract or that piece by the prime and if they were how did that obviously four million dollars on the lease itself was was just one element um did they take themselves out of the competition based on the fact that the margins then would have been too thin no what happened is the four million dollars came out of their overhead rates their overhead cost pools so it reduced their overhead rate so it, it wasn't a direct dollar for dollar hit because remember your rate is a percentage. 
So they went from, you know, let's give an example of overhead rate of 350% to overhead rate of 300%. It would have been applied to the direct labor cost on that contract. So okay. that reduced. So what we did is we redid the cost submission. We redid the cost proposal for the correct rates. And it brought the value of the contract down as opposed to what their initial proposal was. Is it safe to say that someone that is a commercial entity, they're practicing gap accounting and then it's going to be different because they're now going and they're transitioning to government contracting? Well, what I, what I tell companies that are looking to get in government accounting, uh, government contracting is you're going to have three sets of books. They kind of look at me, what do you mean? Well, you're going to have your gap books. You're going to have your books for the IRS. And then you're going to have your books for the government. And all three have to reconcile. They treat, each of those categories treat costs differently. And, and so you you're end up having three sets of books. Now, you can, and this is where I try to encourage them on the commercial side, is to make their commercial accounting, their gap accounting level, the same they're doing with the government. It makes it much easier to reconcile the, the general ledgers to the job cost ledgers to everything if you're talking the same language to a, to a degree. And if you have a company that has commercial and government, what I tell them is that you're going to have a set of indirect rates for the government because there's certain things they won't pay for. We're going to develop you a set of indirect rates for your commercial side of the house because everything the government doesn't pay for, you can throw into your commercial cost structure and your commercial customers will pick up that cost. So you end up having two sets of indirect rates. But if you're not doing your commercial cost accounting like you do your government cost accounting, you don't know what that is. You don't know what you can push through to your commercial customers that the government says it won't pay for. So that's what I try to encourage them to do mm -hmm. is, is look at it that way. And, and again, it gives them an insight into cost drivers on the commercial side that under basic gap accounting, you don't see because you don't get that level of detail broken, broken out. So it can be an advantage. You could recommend or say the top three things associated with indirect rates, looking at everything that we've, you know, listening to everything that we've talked about so far. What three, three things would you say are most important to a company that's engaging in government contracts regarding the indirect rates? The most important thing is to understand your line of work, your business, and what is the indirect cost structure that is most appropriate that will allow you maximum recovery of your cost within the rules, the complexity of the rules the government imposes on you. Once you've identified those, it's monitoring them. Um, because the government you know, a lot of companies will get what's called multi-year contracts. Mm -hmm. The out years are budgets, they're guesses. The current year is what the government is looking at most importantly. So even that to a degree is a budget because you're assuming you're gonna get a certain level of work through, it's gonna drive your direct costs, it's gonna drive these costs, those costs. You get, at the beginning of the year, you submit to the government, these are the rates we think we're gonna have for the year. You don't sit back and wait till year end to say, okay, what do we do? The government expects you to do at least six months, and I try to encourage my, my clients every three months, go back and look at your actuals compared to what you thought you were going to do and make sure you're still on target. If for some reason there's <laughs> a significant shift, you get a lot more work in than you thought, or you're getting a lot less work in than you thought, and your rates are changing by five, 10, 15%, you need to redo your rates and resubmit them so that they represent what you're actually doing. But to do that, you need to understand, is this a temporary glitch that'll correct itself during the year because maybe the government's delayed um, awarding a contract and it's kind of thrown it from the first quarter to the third quarter. Okay, if it's a temporary, then you don't worry about it. But if it's a permanent, fix for that year, you want to make sure that when you do, because when you set rates at the beginning of the year, those are rates you use for all your contracts that you're going to propose on that year. 
Well, if those rates are significantly changed mid-year and say the rates are higher, well, you want to use those higher rates on proposal before. Well, you can't do that until you resubmit it to the government and get them to accept that change in rates. So understand what your business is and what are the appropriate indirect cost pools for that business. Monitor through the year. Make sure you're still on track. If you're not on track, resubmit so that at year end, you're not in a position to where either you've, you know, you've not made the money you thought because your year didn't turn out the way it was. You've been doing this a long time. Why do you think people do wait? Why do you think they do delay? You'd be surprised the number of people who get in government contracts who think this is just a gravy thing. I can just do this and not worry about anything. Yep. And I've seen that a lot. Uh, those are the people that end up in jail half the time. Wow. Um, they what they don't realize and and this is key here what they don't realize is the government pays you to be compliant so when they bring somebody like me in, they bring an attorney in who's in government contracting to help them get their infrastructure their contracts their finance everything compliant to the rules and regulations all that goes into your indirect rates and gets applied to the contracts on a go forward basis the government expects you to spend the money up front, make sure you're compliant, but they're willing to pay you for it on their contracts on a go-forward basis. So you're not doing this with no return, okay? And, and that's where a lot of companies, they say, well, I don't want to spend the money. They don't want to spend the money up front. So they'll try and work around it, and it never works out that way. Spend the money up front, do it when you're starting, because the government gives you time to work everything together. And one of the biggest areas is written policies and procedures. They want to see that. Do it when you can gradually do it and, and fit so you're not spending a huge amount of resources. Um, I had one client years ago, multi-billion dollar client, decided to get in government contracting. They came in, the government came in and audited them and said, basically, guys, I got people on QuickBooks that are better accounting than you. You got six months to get your accounting system in order or we're canceling the contracts. And these were multi-billion dollar contracts. This was during the beginning of the Afghan war and the war in Iraq. And they had huge contracts. Um, and, and they spent millions of dollars because they had to bring in multiple consultants to try to turn things around in a six month period. So it can cost you. I had one client, we talked about the defective pricing before. They got, they found one of their subs, they gave them bad numbers. They went to the government, voluntarily told them, hey, we found this, it meets defective pricing. We're willing to pay you three times to settle it. Well, the government in its infinite wisdom said, you know, in this particular contract involved thousands of parts, they were refurbishing some helicopters. So the government in its infinite wisdom said, well, if it's there, it's got to be uh, elsewhere. It's got to be everywhere. I got involved. Uh, by the time we went to court, it had been going on for 15 years. By the time the court, the judge ruled, it was 17 years. We won the case. But that whole time, all the costs that that contractor incurred to fight this claim is unallowable cost. So it's coming off their bottom line. Now they won the case, they could go back and try to get reimbursed. The maximum they could get reimbursed is 80%, assuming they even get that. Yeah. So they had 17 years of cost. Didn't cost the government, I mean, well, it costs taxpayers. But the government doesn't know about them, they don't care. They tied them up for 17 years. So, you know, these, these, it can be very expensive not to spend a few dollars to have the right people in your back pockets, consultants and attorneys, and attorneys are very, very important in this area, to work with you for something the government will pay you to do right. Like the old mechanics adage, you know, pay me a little bit now to fix a small problem and pay me a heck of a lot more later to fix a bigger problem. Do you think a lot of it has to do with the 
the dollar signs in the eyes of the executives or yeah okay. oh yeah i mean and it also like this company out in california that i talked about where they had that 1.5 million dollar claim we pointed out a lot of things that they still need to do and they're still doing work yeah. but the executives within the company are are salespeople, and salespeople don't care so they're plodding along and i'm just waiting for the next shoe to drop yeah, you know, covered, so. you, you've covered a lot of really good things today, and um, I think it's going to raise a lot of questions, and it's going to spur a lot more discussion later. So thank you for sharing your views um, on indirect rates. What is the best way for um, uh, for people to get a hold of you? I'm going to add your information here um, throughout the throughout the course of the presentation, but. People yeah. listening, what's the best way to reach you? Well, one of the best ways, when you, if they want to learn more about me, they can go to my website, which is tdgovernmentsolutions.biz, B-I-Z. Uh, my phone number is 814-536-1861. And the way I do things, you know, people call, like when I do these classes, they call. And if I can answer something in a short phone call or a short email, I don't charge them. I mean, that's just me educating them. If it's gonna be more involved, I'll let them know it's more involved and what the potential cost is and they can decide whether they wanna hire me or not. That's fair, that's fair. Well, Tim, thank you. Thank you so much for all this. And um, I look forward to talking to you again real soon. Yeah, it was great, I enjoyed it, thanks. You're welcome.